Hi guys, this is your lecture for October 26th. We're going to be covering pages 139 through 145. And today's focus is really going to be largely the War of 1812, which began in 1812 and um, continued until 1815. All right, so the War of 1812 is one that we don't really talk a lot about in American history, and that's because it's kind of a war that there's not really a clear-cut victory for America, and so it's kind of embarrassing. It's not like we can brag about it like we do World War II. Um, it's one that it's more like the White House caught set on fire, and there was a lot of embarrassment um, that happened on, on the field. So before we can get into the War of 1812, let's talk briefly about Madison. Madison becomes the fourth president of the United States. Jefferson retired after uh, two terms. He wanted James Madison to be his successor. And with Madison on their ticket, the Republicans easily defeated the Federalist candidate, Charles C. Pinckney. James Madison is a very interesting figure. He is nicknamed the father of the Constitution. He was an incredibly intelligent man, but he was also uh, very sickly. He was a small, frail man, and his nickname was Frail Jimmy. At five, four, he was the smallest president of the United States, but he was a strong leader with keen political insight. He was quiet, scholarly, and not given much to small talk, and he had a calm demeanor, and he was always prepared. He married his wife when he was 43, and she, Dolly Madison, was 26. And Dolly Madison is very, very important to the role, creating the role of first lady. Uh, a lot of what we think of as the first lady originated with Dolly Madison. And ice cream was one of Madison's favorite foods. Okay, just like I said earlier, Dolly Madison really helped create the role of first lady. She was a vivacious social butterfly. In fact, Dolly Madison and James Madison were opposites in a lot of ways. Uh, you can almost think of it as the class nerd getting with the popular girl, and they lived happily ever after. That's kind of their story. So she was a, a vivacious social butterfly. She helped create a thriving capital. She helped serve ice cream at the White House, which was obviously a delicacy. It's not like you go to Food Lion and pick up a container. Her favorites were apricot and pink peppermint and strawberry. Uh, ice cream. And maybe she even liked oyster, uh, which of course we wouldn't think of that as a very good ice cream flavor, but they were experimenting a lot back then. Okay, so in 1809, Congress replaced the Embargo Act with the Non-Intercourse Act, which forbade trade with England and France, but reopened American commerce with the rest of the world. And because this act did not stop the attacks on American ships, Congress replaced it with the Macon Bill, which provided for the reopening of trade with all nations, stating that either England or France would cease to violate the neutral commerce of the United States, America would reinstitute a no trade policy against the other. Although the Macon Bill did much to aid American commerce, it also led the U.S. into serious trouble. So remember, America is not super strong as a nation yet. She's still trying to get her footing. And France and England have troubles with each other, and they take it out on American ships. And so what America is trying to do is to get the rating to stop. And their hope is, is that they can get one of the two nations, England or France, on their side. And then whichever one was on their side, they would then have a, um, uh, a no-trade policy with the other, uh, against the, the one that was not on their side. Okay, so I want you to open up your books and take a moment to read The Responsibilities of Freedom. It's a very important little section. Okay, so Napoleon Bonaparte, who of course was France, uh, France's leader, used the Macon Bill as a chance to stop trade between the Britain and the U.S. So he claimed that France was revoking the Berlin and Milan decrees, on the condition that either England would renounce her orders in council or America would revert to a new trade policy. And so it seemed that Madison really had no choice but to adhere to the terms of the Macon Bill because Napoleon was acting like he was friends with the United States. So Madison sent word to Britain that if the orders in council were not repealed, 
In three months, the U.S. would cut off trade with England. And it soon became evident that Napoleon had no intention of abiding by his agreement, for French ships continued to seize American cargo on the high seas. Madison felt that the U.S. had changed its mind too many times. It could not expect to maintain any respect, either among its own citizens or among foreign nations, if it backed down on its demands. So in compliance with Napoleon's wishes, Congress cut off all trade with England in March 1811. And uh, a lot of Americans felt like their national honor was at stake, and a lot of Americans were actually clamoring for war. And the loudest cries came from the South and the Western frontier. And it's important to note that at this time, there was a new generation rising up in Congress um, in 1810. There was a new American statesman that was unlike the ones before. They were uh, representatives of an extremely patriotic worldview for America, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but they are nicknamed war hawks because they're willing to go to war to defend America and their extreme patriotism. They also had visions of American expansion. They wanted America to expand beyond her current borders. So Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun would both play a crucial role in shaping America's destiny. And these young statesmen, like I said earlier, want war. They want war with Great Britain. They want to protect their nation's honor. And here are some pictures of Clay and Calhoun. So meanwhile, American frontiersmen were confronted with growing Indian unrest. White settlers moving into the Northwest Territory threatened to deprive the Indians of their hunting grounds, and many whites cheated the Indians out of their land. Although Washington, Adams, and Jefferson had made honest attempts to protect Indian rights, they had been unable to stop aggressive frontiersmen from forcing Indians farther and farther back from the Ohio Valley. So in 1810, a Shawnee medicine man known as the Prophet began to encourage the Indians to remove all white influence from their culture. His brother was a Shawnee chief, his name was Tecumseh, traveled from present-day Wisconsin to West Florida, convincing tribes to join in a confederacy to drive the whites from their land. Tecumseh saw that there was strength in a union. Does this sound familiar? Well, it should sound a little bit familiar because it's uh, very similar to what the 13 colonies did when they declared war on Great Britain, they all formed a united front in hopes of, of overcoming their foe. Here's a picture of Tecumseh, he's right here, and then here is the prophet. So there is a battle, not only is our people clamoring for war with Great Britain, not only is America having issues with Great Britain and France, but then there is also uh, strife with the Native Americans. So there's this battle, the Battle of Tippecanoe, that um, wages in 1811, and this uh, battle um, was the Indian Confederacy against the United States. So the Indian Confederacy was centered in the Indian Territory where Tip Canoe Creek flows into the Wabash River. While Tecumseh was away recruiting more allies, the governor of the Indian Territory, William Henry Harrison, and force set out to destroy the Indian settlement. And in 1811, the prophet, November 1811, the prophet led a daring raid on the soldiers while the soldiers were camped along the banks of the tip of canoe. And after a fierce battle, Harrison finally forced the Indians to retreat. And the Battle of Tip of Canoe largely crushed the Indian Confederacy. But individual tribes continued to make bloody raids on white settlements along the western frontier. William Henry Harrison is important to note because he's actually going to be a future president. But he became... Famous in the War of 1812, um, he is governor of Indian Territory, the governor of Indian Territory. He later becomes the ninth president of the U.S. He's actually going to be the president who serves the shortest term of any American president. Um, and that's because he catches pneumonia and dies shortly after taking office. But here is a picture of Harrison's and Tecumseh's relationship. You can see it looks rather volatile. So Westerners are calling for war, like I said, and American frontiersmen believe that the British in Canada and the Spanish in West Florida uh, were partly responsible for the Indian hostilities, with visions of driving the troublesome British out of North America 
and perhaps even drive me Spanish from Florida, Westerners began to call for a war. So finally, by the summer of 1812, maintaining peace seems absolutely hopeless. So Madison submits a message to Congress in which he lists four reasons for war against Great Britain. The first is an impressment. Remember, the impressment is going to be the uh, taking by force of American seamen to serve in the British Army. A violation of American rights within American territorial waters violation of America's neutral trade rights by the orders in council and the stirring up of frontier engines. So Congress takes this and Congress have a divided reaction to it. Northeastern congressmen do not want war, but the South and the West strongly favor war. And the Congress is going to usually is going to come together and they're actually going to declare war on June 18th. Interestingly enough, on June 16th, the British announced that the orders in council would be revoked on June 23rd, which is what the Americans wanted in the first place, but the Congress did not know that, and therefore they declared war against Great Britain. Here are just a few political cartoons from the era and different images. So the this is the war, like I said, that Americans don't really know much about. It has not entered the public consciousness like so many other wars America was involved in. It would be really a series of small conflicts fought between small armies over a period of about two and a half years. And most of the battles were American losses too. The war was the main issue of the 1812 presidential election, and most Republicans supported Madison for a second term. However, New England Republicans and the Federalists supported DeWitt Clinton of New York, but Madison easily won the majority of electoral votes. So America really goes to war unprepared. Jefferson's policies of frugality had improved the national economy, but they had been detrimental to national defense. So America's army consisted of 7,000 poorly trained men, and its navy consisted of 16 warships. As you can imagine, they weren't overly prepared for war. Massachusetts and Connecticut opposed the war and refused to allow their state militias to be called out for duty. And America's only real advantage was that England was far too busy fighting Napoleon the early years of the war to concentrate on the conflict with the U.S. Financing the war was difficult. Foreign trade had all but stopped, which resulted in a sharp decline in tariff revenues, which was a major source of uh, government income, and money was also scarce because the Republican Congress had not renewed the charter of the National Bank when it expired in 1811, and because the financiers of the Northeast refused to make loans to the government. Okay, so America mistakenly believed that it would be easy to invade Canada. American forces attempted a three-pronged attack from Detroit, from across the Ni Niagara River, and from Lake Champlain. Indian tribes sided with the British, which is natural, because the British promised to give them back land if they beat the Americans. So together, the Indians and the British sent the Americans running. One of the major battles uh, was the fall of Detroit. So in August 1812, American General Hull surrendered Detroit to the British almost without firing shots. A British force under Major General Isaac Brock with Native American allies under the Shawnee Reef Tecumseh used bluff and deception to intimidate the American Brigadier General William Hull into surrendering the fort and town of Detroit. Michigan and a dispirited army which nevertheless outnumbered the victorious British and Native Americans. Um, so there's some interesting clippets of conversation from the fall of Detroit. So the British General Isaac Brock to General Hall says, I require your immediate surrender. And a British soldier recalls, if they did not yield in three hours, he would blow up every one of them. And this is the only time in history that a white flag was raised over an American city before a foreign army. And Hull writes regarding the surrender, I have done what my conscience directed. I have saved Detroit from the horrors of an Indian massacre. The Indians also take Fort Dearborn, which is the present site of Chicago, and they massacre their captives. So America lost most of the Northwest Territory to the British and just a few failed moves from the British. 
so we're going to pause here and we'll do part two in just a moment.